Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Matrices. The most important topic discussed in this video is the matrix of a linear map. Let's begin with a quick review of our notation. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. We also let V and W denote vector spaces over F. As we will see, matrices provide a very efficient method of recording information about linear maps. Before we get to that, we need to define matrices. Suppose M and N are positive integers. An M by N matrix A is a rectangular array of elements of our scalar field F with M rows and N columns. So it looks like what you see here. Usually a matrix is surrounded either with parentheses or square brackets. I tend to use parentheses. The notation A sub J comma K denotes the entry in row J column K of our matrix A. Notice the notation here and compare it to the notation we use for elements of Fn. If we have a vector X in Fn, we usually denote the Jth coordinate by X sub J. We do something similar with matrices. If we have a matrix A, we note the entry in row J, column K, using the same letter, A, and then subscripted with J, comma, K. Remember that the first index in such a subscript always refers to the row number, and the second index refers to the column number. Thus, for example, A sub 2, comma, 3 refers to the entry in the second row, third column. Rows come first then columns. For example, suppose A is the matrix shown here. Then A sub 2, 3 is the entry in row 2, column 3, which is 7, which is shown in red in the matrix so that you can locate it easier. Now we come to the crucial definition in this video. Suppose T is a linear map from our vector space V to our vector space W. Suppose also that we have a basis V1 up to Vn of V and a basis W1 up to Wm of W. The matrix of T with respect to these bases is the M by N matrix whose entries are defined as follows. For each K, we look at T of Vk. That's some element of W, so it's a linear combination of the basis vectors W1 up to Wm. You can see it written here as a linear combination. In that linear combination, we let the coefficient of w sub j be denoted by a sub j comma k, and that's how we form our matrix. Obviously, the matrix of T with respect to these bases depends upon the bases. So if the bases are not clear from the context, we'll include that in the notation, writing m of T comma the first basis comma the second basis. However, often we'll leave the bases out because it's clear from the context what they are, and we'll simply write m of t. Let's try to understand better what's going on with this definition of the matrix of a linear map. Thus, suppose again that t is a linear map from our vector space v to our vector space w, and then we have a basis v1 up to vn of v, and a basis w1 up to wm of w. To visualize the matrix and the meaning of the matrix, it may help to write the basis for V, that's the domain space, across the top as shown here, and to write the basis of W, that's the space we're mapping into, on the left as a column as shown here. Now fix K and think of T of VK. That's a vector in W. Because W1 up to WM form a basis for W, we can write T of VK as some linear combination of W1 up to WM. We take those coefficients and we write them as the kth column of our matrix, as shown here. Thus, the picture above should remind you that T of VK can be computed from the matrix by multiplying each entry in the kth column by the corresponding WJ from the left, and then adding up the resulting vectors. In other words, we have the equation in the middle of the page reflected in the matrix at the top of the page. 
Remember that this matrix depends upon the linear map T and the bases V1 up to Vn for V and W1 up to Wm of W that are chosen. Often we'll leave the bases out of the notation because they should be clear from the context. So often we write just M of T, but that matrix depends very much on the basis chosen for V and the basis chosen for W. Let's look at two examples of the matrix of a linear map. Our first example is a linear map from F2 to F3. This linear map is called T, and it's defined as we see here in this equation. We want to write the matrix of T with respect to the standard bases. Recall that the standard basis of F2 is the list 1, 0, and then 0, 1, and the standard basis for F3 is the list 1, 0, 0, that's the first vector. Second vector in the list is 0, 1, 0. Third vector is 0, 0, 1. Thus, to find our matrix of T, first we need to evaluate T on the basis vectors. That's done in the third line on this slide, where we see what T of 1, 0 and T of 0, 1 are, simply using the formula for T above. Let's start by looking at t of 1, 0, which is the vector 1, 2, 7. That vector is 1 times the first basis vector of F3, plus 2 times the second basis vector of F3, plus 7 times the third basis vector of F3. Thus, the numbers that go in the first column are 1, 2, 7. Similarly, the numbers that go in the second column are 3, 5, 9. For our next example, let D be the linear map from the vector space of polynomials with degree less than or equal to 3, mapping into the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients with degree less than or equal to 2, and d is defined by d of a polynomial is its derivative. The standard basis of P3 of R is the list 1, x, x squared, x cubed, and the standard basis for the vector space P2 of R is the list 1, comma x, comma x squared. Let's find the matrix of our linear map T with respect to these standard bases. Our first basis vector is the constant function 1, and its derivative is 0, so the first column consists just of zeros. Our second basis vector is x, its derivative is the constant function 1, so the second column of our matrix is 1, 0, 0. Our third basis vector is x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x. Thus, our third column is 0, 2, 0. The last vector in our basis for P3 of R is x cubed. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. Thus, the fourth column of the matrix is 0, 0, 3. Notice that the matrix of a linear map T from V to W completely determines T. The reason for this is that the matrix tells us what T does to each vector in a basis of V. But by linearity, T is determined by what it does on a basis. Thus, matrices are an efficient way of recording information about linear maps. We now begin a discussion about the connection between the algebra of linear maps and the algebra of matrices. It's certainly reasonable to ask, as a first question, if the matrix of the sum of two linear maps is the sum of the matrices. Right now, that question actually makes no sense. We have defined the sum of two linear maps, but we have not yet defined the sum of two matrices. Let's take care of that by making that definition now. The sum of two matrices of the same size is the matrix obtained by adding corresponding entries. In other words, it's exactly what you would expect. With this definition of matrix addition, everything works out nicely. Specifically, suppose S and T are linear maps from V to W. Then the matrix of S plus T is equal to the matrix of S plus the matrix of T, where, of course, adding those matrices is done with the definition that we just gave. One further comment, we have three linear maps in sight here, s, t, and s plus t. For the last equation to be true, we have to use the same bases 
for all three of those linear maps. We now turn to the question about scalar multiplication. Is the matrix of a scalar times a linear map equal to the scalar times the matrix of the linear map? Again, this question does not yet make any sense because we have not yet defined how to multiply a scalar by a matrix. So let's fix that problem. The product of a scalar and a matrix is the matrix obtained by multiplying each entry of the matrix by the scalar. In other words, it does, again, exactly what you would expect. With that definition, again, everything turns out nicely and easily. Specifically, suppose T is a linear map from V to W and lambda is a scalar field. Then the matrix of lambda times T equals lambda times the matrix of T. Again, for this equation to be true, we have to use the same bases throughout. Let's introduce some notation to note the set of all m by n matrices. That notation will be f superscript m comma n. This notation is consistent with the kind of notation we used for fn denoting the set of all lists of n numbers. Now with two numbers in the superscript, it's not just a list, but it's a matrix. And the m comma n in the superscript tell us the size of the matrix. Once we have defined addition and scalar multiplication of matrices, it should not be a surprise to you that a vector space is lurking nearby. Indeed, that's true. Fix positive integers m and n. Then, with the addition and scalar multiplication that we defined previously, f superscript m comma n is a vector space. Furthermore, this vector space has dimension m times n. The proof that we have a vector space is easy, and the details are left to you. The proof about the dimension is also easy, because the basis for this vector space consists of the matrices that have a 1 in one entry and a 0 everywhere else. There are m times n such matrices. This concludes part 1 of the video on matrices.